Uh, and thanks to everybody. I, I, you've probably never seen a talk that manages to go all the way from black holes to economic development in the same 30 minutes, <laughs> but that's what I'm gonna try to do. And it, it, it is probably about 30 minutes, but let me see if I can share my screen here. What I'm gonna try to do is, first of all, tell you a little bit about general relativity and black holes. And I'm actually gonna to try to, I'm gonna explain the basic ideas of Einstein's uh, theories, uh, but uh, it turns out that there are lessons to be learned in terms of public policy and economic development. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get to that. So uh, as some of you who know, know me, uh, uh, know that I spent a lot of my career actually working on gravitational waves and black holes. And I used to be at this place called the Max Planck Institute for Gravitational Physics or Gravitationsphysik in German, in Potsdam, in Germany. And it was really the highlight of my scientific career. And there was an incredibly big discovery, like a, a momentous discovery uh, in physics about three or four years ago. And so Physics Today uh, commemorated this, but so did everybody else. And if you somehow missed it, you just weren't watching any news outlet, any news outlet that would have covered this on the front page a few years ago when gravitational waves from colliding black holes were actually discovered. So I'll get into that a little bit. And then I'm also going to show how with not only lessons learned, but with a foundation laid by basic science, we have amazing developments in, in our lives uh, in terms of uh, devices that we have, all the computing, Everything that we do today in terms of society around computing, technology, economic development related to that, uh, it really comes out of a foundation and basic science laid out by Albert Einstein. So one of the, the relatively small things compared to all of the big things I'm talking about here would include the development of the, web, the World Wide Web and the graphical web browser that we use every day now on every device, including my watch has a web browser on it now, as it, probably some of you do as well. This has added many trillions of dollars to the world economy, and it, it really comes directly out of some of the work that I'm going to tell you about. So, so let me start by explaining a little bit about who Albert Einstein was. He was not only an incredible scientist, but one who had impact and had a, a, a philosophical view of the world, I would say. And he spent 10 years working on his theory of general relativity or the general theory of relativity that he unveiled on November 25th, 1915. So it turns out almost exactly a hundred years later was a, an, a big, big experiment, a worldwide experiment done that, that proved his theories. And so the one thing I really want to point out here is his um, wife, um, Maleva, uh, was actually a physicist and his partner and the un unsung hero of many of his great contributions to physics. She did not co-author any papers with him. And if you, you, if you have some time, I'd urge that you watch the National Geographic series on the history of Albert Einstein. They have an eight part series where it is very clearly shown and is historically accurate that he, when he was stuck on a lot of his physics problems, she was there to help him out. And she didn't get the credit for it. Uh, unlike Marie Curie, who did get a Nobel Prize because her husband, Pierre, insisted. They wanted to give it just to him. And he insisted that she be co-honored with him. And they, they agreed to. But Einstein did not do this with his wife. And so he's a complicated figure. Just want to point this out. So, oh, by the way, in case you weren't watching, on February the 11th, 2016, there, were, uh, there was incredible news. The front page of every newspaper, every news outlet around the world uh, carried this story about the, the announcement of the discovery of gravitational waves from colliding black holes. And so Einstein predicted this theory, or uh, developed this theory of general relativity and predicted that there would be black holes and there would be things called gravitational waves that were before that never even suspected. They came directly out of his work on the theory of gravitation. And a hundred years later, they were actually discovered. So I have worked directly on this problem and I was actually invited to the National Press Club in Washington, DC. And I was there for the announcement and it, it brought tears to my eyes. I mean, literally brought tears to my eyes when, when this happened. And by the way, this is the local newspaper in Champaign-Urbana uh, pointing out that NCSA, which is the center at the time that I was directing, actually played a role in the, in the discovery. So it was, it was kind of a cool thing for me. So um, another thing I wanna point out is that uh, we've made a lot of progress in terms of women in science and being recognized. So this is Gabriela Gonzalez, who's a, a friend of mine that I've known since she was a graduate student. She was the spokesperson for the LIGO collaboration. LIGO is the, um, the, the international collaboration 
of scientists, thousands of scientists around the world who work together. And Gabriella was the spokesperson. And this is her making the announcement at the National Press Club in Washington. So, so let me explain a little bit about where, where do these gravitational waves come from and, and so on. So about a billion years ago, literally a billion years ago, two enormous black holes, each about 30 to 40 times the mass of the sun collided at nearly the speed of light. And you'd think that this would be have nothing to do with us because it's a billion light years away then. So it's very, very far in a distant corner of the galaxy. And we'll never know exactly where it happened, but we know that it happened because we detected the signal. So at that time, there were these two black holes. And this is a, a, the result of a supercomputer simulation carried out by some, some, uh, some friends of mine. Uh, and it, it shows, if you can see this, this is a supercomputer simulation of two black holes going around each other. Um, the, the stars behind are all distorted because their light rays get bent by the gravitational field and they collide. A big black hole is formed and out comes a burst of, of radiation that is more powerful than all the stars in the universe combined, but for just a tiny fraction of a second. And then a billion years later, we detected this. Now, it's important to point out that a billion years later means a billion years ago, there wasn't even life on the earth. I mean, there was, there was, there was basically a, like singular cellular life of, on the earth at that time. There was no Einstein, there was no scientific community, but these waves are coming towards us. So we had to have life form on the earth and then we had to have the development of science. And then eventually only a hundred years ago, did Einstein come along to predict that this could have happened. And then we built the technologies to detect it. So think about this as like a race. These waves are coming at us for a billion years. And then eventually just in the nick of time, we built this detector and we turned it on. And within days, within days of turning on the detector, those waves arrived. It's a, it's a really exciting, it's an exciting event in the history of science. So let me tell you about his theories. So there are two big things I'm going to tell you about. The one is called special relativity. And so you might remember from high school that he had this amazing theory that says, if you're moving along, uh, you, if you're moving, time and space are perceived differently. They're not just perceived differently, they are actually different. But the thing that it's really important to understand is the ideas that Einstein based his theories on are extremely simple. They're very, very simple ideas, but he was the first one to be able to carry them all the way to a logical conclusion. So this one is that if you're in a train or a car and it's moving along, let's say at hundred miles an hour along the highway or along a train track, but it's perfectly smooth, you don't feel like you're moving, right? You don't feel like you're moving at all when you're in the car. But you see, but what you see from your point of view is the world is coming at you at 100 miles an hour, you know, but, but otherwise you don't feel it at all. Or if you're standing on the side of the road, you don't feel it at any difference at all. So from your point of view, standing on the side of the road, you see a car coming down the road towards you. Um, it, it, it looks like it's coming at you, but if you're in the car, it looks like the person on the road is coming at you. It just depends on your point of view. That's the, the relativity. It's the special theory of relativity. So it's all relative. But so Einstein said, actually, there is no experiment that I could do inside that train that tells me that it's any different from standing on the side of the road. And he said, so therefore, I postulate that the laws of nature are actually exactly the same in that train as they are on the side of the road. So this sounds like, okay, that sounds fine, right? But there's a second point that he knew, which was the speed of light is the same. The speed of the photons coming out of this flashlight um, that you would measure if you're standing on the side of the road or if you're in a moving train, there it's actually the same. And this doesn't seem like this could be right. Because imagine, imagine I have a baseball and I throw a baseball at you, like I'm Nolan Ryan, and I throw 100 miles per hour, right? So I'm showing my age, but fastball, 100 miles per hour, it comes at you and you catch it, but you measure it's 100 miles per hour. It turns out if if you're on the train and you're also moving at 100 miles an hour, then that ball should be coming at you at 200 miles an hour, right? That's just like, that's what we would, that's what we would expect. But it turns out light, the speed is actually the same no matter how fast the, the source is moving. Now this doesn't make sense, but it's true. And so Einstein said, the only way that these two things can both be true, that is that the, the laws of physics are the same in a moving vehicle or moving frame of reference and the speed of light is the same, is that the, the distances and the time 
uh, that it takes for something to move have to be changed in some way in order for that speed to be measured to be the same. So he, he, he realized that it's not just like a mathematical formula, it's a physical effect. If you're moving in a train, time is actually moving slower for you. And so the, the basic thing he found is that moving clocks go slow and that rulers shrink in the motion of direction that, that they're moving. And so there are lots and lots of experiments over the last hundred years since he, since he came up with this theory in 1905 um, that have proved that this is actually true. So this is like, in essence, that's the simple theory of special relativity. Now, why haven't we noticed this? The reason is we haven't noticed this because um, the, the, the impact of this slowing down of time and, the, and the, shrink, the shrinking of rulers is so small that we never notice it unless you're moving near the speed of light. And since we never move at the speed of light, it's not part of our intuition. Okay. So the second thing, this is the hardest part. This is the hardest slide. It's going to get easier after this one, is that um, he thought about for 10 more years, he said, my, my theory doesn't include the gravitational field. So how can I include the gravitational field? And he thought about this and he said, okay, if if I'm Newton and I'm sitting under the tree and I'm waiting for an apple to fall on my head, that's due to gravity, that the gravitational field pulls the apple out of the tree and it falls and hits me on the head. He said, that is exactly the same as if I'm again in a moving spaceship or didn't have spaceships then, but a moving train that's, that's accelerating now. <laughs> it's not just moving at a constant speed. It's getting faster and faster. Like if you're in a car and you, you put the, your foot to the, the floor on the accelerator, you feel yourself being pushed back in the, in, the, in the seat, right? You feel yourself being pushed back because it's accelerating. And Einstein thought about this for 10 years. And he says, there is no experiment I could do that could determine that it's any different sitting in an accelerating frame of reference like a, like the, um, like a spaceship that's accelerating or a gravitational field. And so then he thought, aha, uh -huh, I know how I can turn this into a theory. So I'm gonna skip the thing about the helium balloon in a car, but I'll just say, get a helium balloon, get in a car, and then at a red light, just accelerate. And you'll find the helium balloon does a very surprising thing. It doesn't move backwards, it moves forwards because it's like it's a gravitational field and therefore it feels like it's moving away from the gravitational field so it has to move forward. So think about that and go try it out. It, it, it'll surprise you. And he also predicted from this that gravitational field can bend light. No one had thought of that before. So very simple idea. So this is the, I, I, I lied to you. This is the hardest, the hardest one of all, the hardest of the, uh, of the slides. But he, he then began to think about people on a merry-go-round. And he, this is literally in his first paper. He uses a merry-go-round to illustrate this. And he considers three different people the person standing in the middle of it, the person, the attendant standing on the side, and the person who's going around the merry-go-round um, on, the, on the edge. And he says, well, let's see, the, the, the person B and person A are not moving with respect to each other. So they ought to see the same things, but person C and A are also not moving with respect to each other. So they ought to see the same things, but persons B and C are moving. So therefore persons B's clock should go slower than person C. And so should the rulers get shrunk up? So that doesn't, that doesn't really make sense. But when he thought it through more deeply, he says, uh-huh, A and B are different because A doesn't feel any, maybe feeling dizzy, but doesn't feel any forces. But B feels the force, like if you're in the rotor at the, at the amusement park, you feel like you're being pushed up against the, the edge of the, you know, you know, that thing goes round and round. You feel like you're being pushed up against the wall. That's like a gravitational field. So this whole thing goes to show that he worked out that in a gravitational field, time slows down and rulers shrink. And so that means that the geometry of space is changed by a gravitational field. So this is like really, really mind blowing. And this is what causes a, when, when you have a black hole, it's basically that you hear about the warping of space time. This it comes all from this little merry-go-round thought experiment that Einstein worked at. So he worked, he thought about that for 10 years. So, so that's all I'm going to say about the theory. But you see, the ideas are really simple. The math was hard, and it turned out he he spent 10 years learning the math from his friend Marcel Grossman to be able to do this. And I'll, I'll come back to that in a minute. So anyway, out of this theory were predicted these um, things. And two base, two really important things were that there could be a black hole. And what is a black hole? It means a star 
has run out of its nuclear fuel that keeps it puffed up. When it runs out, it gets cold and it collapses down. And if it's massive enough, it can collapse all the way down so that the gravity becomes so strong that not even light can ever get out. So that, that's what a black hole is. So the next thing was gravitational waves. And this is another thing, completely unexpected, came right out of his theory. He knew about it within the first year of, of writing out, of, of discovering his theory. And he says, wait, I have another idea. There could, there could be gravitational waves. There could be these things called gravitational waves. Well, what is a gravitational wave? Well, it turns out we know what light, electromagnetic radiation is or light. You look up and you see lights coming out of your computer screen. Basically, electrons are going back and forth. They're, they're shaking back and forth and that causes electromagnetic radiation. That's, that's what we see. So he said, if you have masses and they move around, there's a different kind of radiation and it's called gravitational radiation. No one had thought of it before. It came out of his theory completely unexpected. And that's what we actually discovered four years ago, this completely un, a heretofore unexpected effect that came directly out of this theory. So I'll, I'll say it turns out that you get more radiation if your, your masses are moving around faster and if they're moving is ir very irregularly. So therefore, if we wanted to ever detect it, we would look for things like colliding black holes because they're like multiple times the mass of the sun colliding at the speed of light. That's a pretty big a pretty big explosion in the universe. And that's what leads to gravitational radiation. So, so Einstein thought about this for about another 20 years. And he, he actually, he began to, to think that this was a mistake that he'd made. And he tried to publish a paper saying that, you know that thing I said about gravitational radiation? I think it was wrong. And um, it turned out somebody had the courage to reject his paper, it didn't get published. And it turned out he was actually right, but he was just confused and tried to, tried to retract his theory. So then he retracted the retraction and decades later, we actually discovered this. So the next thing about Einstein's theories is that they're too complicated mathematically. It's so complicated. In fact, I spent my whole career using supercomputers to try to solve those equations. And he says, he actually said this, do not worry about your difficulties in mathematics. I can assure you mine are still greater. <laughs> And he's very famous for making a, a very deep kind of comments like this. So it turns out that the equations are so complicated, no one could solve them. So people had to develop complicated algorithms. And then supercomputers were driven a lot by the quest to solve Einstein's equations. And I'll, as I'll come to in a minute, the phones and the, the watches we have today are actually driven by the scientific need to try to develop supercomputers to solve equations like these. So a century of work can't solve the equations, can't detect gravitational waves. What are we gonna do? Well, it turned out um, in, uh, on, in, this is uh, September of 2015. So just slightly less than exactly 100 years after his theory, these little squiggles were discovered in a billion dollar experiment supported by the National Science Foundation called LIGO. They have two detectors, one in Washington state and one in Livingston Parish, Louisiana. And the top graphs here are the actual squiggles that people saw when the black holes collided a billion years later when they arrived here. And the bottom ones are the result of numerical simulations of black holes on supercomputers. And this, this my whole career was spent developing the, what those squiggles would look like. That was my, my work. And, uh, and, and so they matched up exactly. So when people saw that, they said, aha, uh -huh, two black holes just collided. And it turns out they could work out that they were a billion light years away. So then this is everywhere in newspapers all over the place. I, I gave this talk to a German high school, actually. So I, I use a German newspaper, but there are more of them. This is the picture of two of the Nobel laureates, Kip Thorne on the right, Ray Weiss on the left. By the way, Ray is from Berlin. He came during the war of World War II, another sort of story of great scientists coming to America um, during uh, times of trouble. America is like a beacon of, of hope and stability and so on. So people come and we benefit tremendously from this. So Ray is a Nobel laureate uh, and Einstein himself came in 1933 as well when, uh, when Hitler rose to power, he left and, and came to the United States as well. So, so anyway, multi-messenger astronomy means that suddenly we can look at, we can make uh, observations of the universe using all kinds of different uh, sources of information from electromagnetic waves, from neutrinos, from uh, gravitational waves. And it's the beginning of a brand new era in science and it's very exciting. And by now there've been dozens and dozens of detections of gravitational waves. And we're learning a lot about the, 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 about the universe because of this. But what I wanna do, oh, 
one last thing, and then I'm going to move on to how, how relevant this is for economic development. So this is something I'm extremely proud of. This is a German postage stamp for 70 uh, euro cents. This visualization was carried out by a former graduate student of mine in Berlin. And so um, this, I feel, I feel like a parent to this postage stamp, <laughs> but it's extremely exciting to see something like this out in the public domain. The only other time I had something quite like this, some simulations that, I, that my, my group did were on the phone book for the Livingston Parish telephone uh, directory. <laughs> and so the, another one because they were commemorating uh, the gravitational waves as well. So it's nice to see this kind of out in the public domain. So, so now let me, let me switch gears and, and say why this is all relevant for our lives. Well, it turned out that these equations were so complicated, they couldn't be solved. The most brilliant mathematicians and physicists worked a century on them. So then a new generation came in and including people like me um, uh, who said, let's try new techniques. Let's try to use computers to solve these equations. So. I wonder if you know what that is. I, I, I guess you probably don't, but um, it is actually a mechanical um, adding machine that was discovered off the Greek islands, of one of the Greek islands, Mykonos, um, in um, it, not so long ago, but it's over 2000 years old. And so if you think about it, it's about the fastest computing machine that we had in humanity um, and it didn't really increase because we had abacuses, we had other kinds of you know, mechanical devices for doing uh, computing and doing arithmetic, we had slide rules and so on um, until about the middle part of the 20th century. And then suddenly the computing power increased by millions and millions and billions and trillions. And in fact, um, 10 to the 20th times, it's unbelievable how much computing power has increased. So it's basically been constant for thousands of years and suddenly it just went through the roof and that's happened during our lifetimes. And so this is a guy who was my postdoc advisor once, Larry Smarr, who was the founder of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. He was trying to solve Einstein's equations, couldn't get enough supercomputer power, couldn't get enough computer power. He was going to Germany to use computers there and he wrote this proposal to the National Science Foundation in 1983 and it was unsolicited. He just he addressed it in a manila envelope to the director of National Science Foundation and says, I need $55 million to build a supercomputer center. And it's going to revolutionize not just science, but American industry competitiveness. And it's going to it's going to be important for everything we do. And this turned out to be true. So there's an industry program. NSF funded this and five other centers. Centers around the world have popped up and it's unleashed this entire computing revolution. So, so now the march of computing power, which were driven, was driven so strongly by the need to solve Einstein's equations, um, has just gone through the roof. So this is a, the first Cray supercomputer uh, in 1980. Um, it turns out that an iPhone 6, this is a, from a talk I gave some years back, um, it has about 1500 times the computing capacity of one of the first supercomputers from 1980. <laughs> and now who carries an iPhone 6? <laughs> They're just like, nobody would want one of those anymore. They're too old. I've just got an iPhone 12. It's hundreds, thousands of times more powerful than that. And now we're moving towards actually circuits in your skin. And it's just amazing what is happening. And the impact on society is astounding. So let me, let me explain a little bit about this, about how science innovates for society. So it turns out Einstein wasn't just a wacky scientist. He actually worked in a patent office. And it turned out this should be a, a, a this should be exciting for any graduate student. He could not get a job coming out of graduate school because basically because he was too much of a smart aleck for his professors and they blackballed him and they, he didn't get a job as an assistant professor. So he went and got a job the only place he could in the patent office, and that gave him the sense of there's a lot of thing a lot of things happening out there that impact people's lives and he th he always thought about the practical implications of the science he was doing and he actually has a US patent from 1927 when he was working at a place called the Harnock House in Berlin but he actually had a US patent on refrigeration and there it's, it's it's an incredible story actually so he not you won't don't think of him as an entrepreneur but he was thinking of ways to improve ordinary devices in our lives as well so Think about something else. 
So Einstein actually didn't get into all this. He laid the foundations for what are known as quantum mechanics and special relativity and general relativity. That lays the foundation for the transistor, for integrated circuits, for computers, and for this GPS device. So it turns out, it wasn't just some engineers got together and said, let's build a GPS device. There is a lot of deep science in there. There's basic chemistry in there that uses atomic clocks in order for us to be able to determine exactly the time and the location of that saddle of that device. It turns out that the LCD, the displays there are based on basic material science. It turns out that the algorithms in there are based on a very advanced mathematics and, and computer science. It turns out that actual astronomy is used in this GPS device. So there are quasars in the universe that are used as a reference frame for the GPS device. And it turns out this wouldn't work if you didn't know both special and general relativity. Remember I said time goes slow in a gravitational field. The satellites are in a different place from where the, the, where the uh, GPS is. And so you have to take that into account. None of this, this simple device would not work with all this science that goes into it. So it's, it's incredible if when you think about it, just this one device that we use every day built into our phones wouldn't work with all this science that goes into it. So plus, and this is a little talk I gave to the students in the honors college, it has to be usable by humans. The humanities and the social sciences are absolutely essential. You have to package it, you have to market it, it's business, it's communication. All of this goes into a successful product. So, so this comes to the last part of my pitch. Universities are hubs of innovation and without the universities, none of this would be possible. And so universities haven't always really embraced their role as hubs of innovation and engines of innovation to power the economy, but this is a growing trend. My last four years before I came here, I was the vice president for economic development at the University of Illinois. And I'm thinking a lot about how to take the University of Wyoming and drive it forward as an engine for innovation for the state of Wyoming, both in terms of economic development, how we educate our citizens, how we create the next generation workforce, how we bring back economic value to the state. So these are companies that came out of the University of Illinois. So this, this is my old uh, slide, but I wanted to point out to you that my job was th for the last four years before coming here was to try to increase the number of companies and to create the conditions that support the growth of companies more than ever. And so I'm bringing these instincts here and I'm beginning to work with, with the legislature, with Governor Gordon, with former governors. I just had a call from Matt Mead just a, a couple of hours ago. We're really thinking a lot about how to increase what we do in terms of bringing back economic value to the, to the state of Wyoming. So just to repeat something I said, without Einstein's work, none of this would be possible. The transistor, computers, television, the internet, GPS, et cetera. The web browser, this is an amazing story. So years ago, when I was a postdoc of Larry Smarr at NCSA, this is like 1990, 1989 to 1992, these two kids, Eric Bina, who lived across the street from me just until a, a few months ago um, in Champaign, uh, and Mark Andreessen, some of you might've heard of Mark. He's one of the biggest venture capitalists in Silicon Valley now. Mark was an undergraduate student and at, that, at the center that was founded to solve Einstein's equations and do other things, they invented the World Wide Web browser, the graphical web browser called Mosaic. And that's what led to this revolution that we have in computing right now. Uh, and so if you look at Internet Explorer, you'll see it says based on NCSA Mosaic coming out of the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. And so did Netscape come out of this, by the way. So all that we do now in terms of using computers and the internet, it really was made possible by these two kids. So we want to develop an environment here at the University of Wyoming in collaboration with the community colleges that produces more people like Eric Bina and Mark Andreessen, creating the conditions and the incentives for them to do this. So the question is then, how do you accelerate the innovation for economic development? Well, I've been working a lot with the community colleges. I've talked with the presidents of all the community colleges and we're, we're getting excited. We're beginning to talk about doing things together for economic development, hubs of innovation, helping to, to create a statewide curriculum for economic development, for computing, for software engineering, and then to help apply this to the different industries that are already in place, to agriculture, to mining, to energy, 
hospitality, and other, other areas that are springing up. For example, blockchain is a big area that's really growing uh, these days. And there's a new center for blockchain technologies for smart contracts and cryptocurrencies and so on. So Wyoming is becoming a hub for some of these things. So, so part of what I'm just saying is we're working hard to take this kind of basic science, learn how to uh, figure out how to commercialize it and how to also grow the workforce in the state of Wyoming so that we can help grow the economy of the state. So um, I'm almost done. I would invite you to take a look to learn more. If you want to learn more about the science, um, uh, watch the movie Interstellar. Um, if you haven't seen it, it was actually, this is a picture of Kip Thorne. So I took this picture of Kip the day that they announced gravitational waves. So not only did he win the Nobel prize, but he's the creative genius behind the movie Interstellar. So he worked with um, Christopher Nolan for seven years on this movie and every single scene in that movie he can explain in terms of some scientific theory how it could possibly happen. So it's really based in science. And he wrote a book called The Science of Interstellar. So I, I would encourage you to at least watch the movie if you haven't seen it. And, and this is really out of the genius of, of Kip Thorne. It's, it's a beautiful movie, but it's based in science. And on the right hand side, there are there are lots of videos out there that talk about it. But in particular, there's a German one because out of coming out of the Albert Einstein Institute where I, where I once worked called scienceface.org, the science, the, the face of science. And there you'll find interviews with Kip and a bunch of people, but also with me telling the story um, how the web browser was born out of Einstein's theories in some ways, <laughs> the story I just told here. So lessons learned. And this is kind of along public policy and, and, uh, and economic development. First of all, the best ideas are the simplest. And Einstein had a great saying. He said, a theory should be as simple as possible, but no simpler. <laughs> so boil it down to the essential elements. Always try to boil something down to the, the essential elements. Perseverance. He was stuck. He was worried others would beat him. David Hilbert basically came up with the equations before him. He was afraid there was this competition. He, he didn't have it. He had it wrong. He had it right. He had it wrong. So he, even great, the great Einstein was confused about things. He was also sometimes ridiculed publicly. Uh, there was a, 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 another famous science uh, a scientist named um, Arthur Eddington, who didn't believe in gravitational waves. And he said, um, he said, gravitational waves propagated the speed of thought. So he thought that it was just a, a figment of Einstein's imagination and quite a, quite a difficult um, relationship. Kip himself told me um, that he, I, I once confided to him, I was frustrated. Some people in my science community maybe didn't, didn't think that much of some of my work. He's like, oh, I, I have people who think my work is terrible all the time, you know? And this is the guy who just won the Nobel prize in physics. So, it, it, so the point is, um, you, you, have to, you have to put up with some difficult times in order to, to, to make some good decisions and, and, and carry them forward. Another point is take the long game. He worked on this theory for 10 years and then he was confused about it forevermore, and, but he just kept following it. So take the long game and then follow the logical consequences of your simple ideas, profound implications and societal impact and basic science has a lot of impact sometimes within a, a months to years and sometimes it takes decades but just keep it going the logical consequences are profound and the science summary it's a fantastic time for science it's one of the greatest discoveries in the history of science was just made in a field that i spent my whole life banging my head against the wall on einstein was right and his theories are based on these simple ideas many places around the world have collaborated including ncar wyoming which is the, our local supercomputing facility is a result in some ways of this quest to get more and more computer power and so on. And, um, and you might be surprised, but uh, people working in even basic science, like I have, I have three graduate students right now still finishing up at the University of Illinois. They are working on gravitational wave data analysis, but they're applying artificial intelligence algorithms. And it, they're so important in industry that two of them are funded currently to finish their PhDs by Capital One, a credit card company. To give you an idea, it sounds like it's very far. Like, what's the importance of this? Well, a Capital One knows it, and they're funding a couple of my grad students back in Champaign right now. So, oh, and by the way, three more Nobel, Nobel prizes were just awarded um, last month for work on black holes: Roger Penrose, um, Reinhard Gensel, and Andrea Goetz. Uh, and finally, a woman, a woman winner of, the, of, the, of a Nobel Prize in Physics for gravitational uh, waves and black holes. So I know I, I, I went very fast through that and I, I don't have much time left, but I hope there's some time for some questions.